Okay, uh, welcome, welcome everybody to this new episode of the podcast uh, Coffee Breakdown. I am Luca, and uh, today we have a new guest uh, who is uh, Jacob Stevens. Jacob is an associate professor at uh, Texas okay. Tech. Assi okay. Assistant okay. professor, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> at um, uh, T Texas Tech University, right? Uh, his research focuses uh, mainly on uh, high power microwave, but he also did research on the temperature plasmas. Uh, he developed codes for for example, accurate solution of electron Boltzmann equation or educational tools. So now maybe we're going to dive a little bit more into that. So thank you very much, Jacob, for being here. Yeah, yeah, thanks and, for having uh, me. Uh, not really sure what to say, uh, but uh, excited for this and uh, interested, interested to see where it goes. Okay, uh, so I'm actually really curious to talk with you, first of all, because uh, as you may know, like I had all my educational and research experiences in Europe. So I would like to hear actually your educational and research experiences in the United States. Sure. Um, if you can introduce a little bit yourself, you know, what you did yeah, and so, so on and what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, maybe we'll just pick up at grad school. So I started doing graduate research as a grad student here at Texas Tech um, in the general field of pulse power. And so, so my research was taking... Um, high voltages, hundreds of kilovolts to megavolts, high currents, you know, uh, kiloamp to 100 kiloamp type, uh, high voltage, high current, and applying that for, for various applications. Um, Such as, uh, may, may I ask, uh, yeah. which, which type of applications uh, mainly? And so that's that's what I was going to go into. That's, okay, okay. <laughs> so this, this, this research was actually funded by the uh, U.S. Army at the time. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of our funding in Pulse Power really comes from uh, primarily Department of Defense uh, funding agencies. And so that's kind of been something that if I were going to really look at like uh, kind of a history of my own research programs, it's always been funding almost exclusively by... Air Force Office of Scientific Research, Office yeah. of Naval Research, uh, Army, uh, National Labs. You, we, we get quite a bit of funding from National Labs, and that's technically okay. under, uh, say, Department of Energy uh, yeah. quite often, the, the work that we do for them, at least. Uh, whereas, you know, whenever I talk to my colleagues that are, you know, from Europe, it seems like a lot of the funding comes from almost always ABB. I don't know what ABB is necessarily, but they must be rich because they, they find a lot of research in Europe, uh, especially on uh, low temperature plasmas, uh, things like that. Um, yeah. But I think that, you know, that, that kind of background influences the nature of the work a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, at least in the, the organizing structure that goes on behind the research. Okay. So I, I think it's interesting, but I also have to give credit to uh, a lot of these institutions, uh, really all of them, the national laboratories, that's uh, Sandia National Labs, Los Alamos National Laboratory, the mm -hmm. Livermore National Lab, uh, and, and give credit to Air Force Office of Scientific Research, Office of Naval Research. They really are, uh, you know, sometimes people, I will say, talk a big talk about how, oh, we're really committed to basic science, but uh, I will say as a, you know, up and coming professor, uh, they carry the Department of Defense tags or Department of Energy tags. But, you know, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, the people that I'm talking with, the people I'm interacting with are uh, scientists, engineers who really understand the technology at a, at a very fundamental level, uh, often at a higher level than I do, especially on the macroscopic scale, which mm -hmm. is really interesting. Uh, but they really have a lot of commitment to the uh, to the basic sciences. And uh, I, I think I struggled a lot in, you know, writing my first proposals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was, I was, I was expecting that I was going to have to, uh, you know, write proposals that would promise that I would develop this particular thing to do this other thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the feedback I always got back from on my proposals was, no, 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 we don't, we, you're, you're a university, we don't want you developing technology, so to speak, we want you to study the mechanics and the physics and the, the basics of it, and that, and that was an interesting, uh, an interesting realization for me, I will say. Okay, okay, so you've been also interested in uh, fundamentals, uh, right, so how did you get uh, into this uh, low temperature plasma effect? Uh? Uh, low temperature plasmas was kind of my uh, pet project through my PhD. Actually, okay. I, didn't, I didn't even do uh, my 
my uh, PhD dissertation was on, uh, it was dense metal plasmas, uh, really. And, and even then, that was kind of a, a stretch to call it that I was studying dense metal plasmas. Realistically, what I was doing, I'm a, my uh, education is all electrical engineering. And I was developing gigawatt class opening switches. Okay. And so we were developing uh, opening switches that would receive kilojoules of energy and gigawatt power levels uh, that were mostly high current, low impedance. And then we were using uh, inductive energy storage systems and uh, uh, fast opening switches to translate that high volt or that low voltage high current into high voltage low current, uh, which is more amenable for uh, high power microwave production. I see. Okay. Okay. All so, right. So uh, that, that was interesting to me, but I kind of uh, took a little bit of a detour on that topic. And uh, I worked on, I, I guess, during the opening switch process, you take a metallic wire, you heat it up, mm -hmm. uh, it rapidly traverses through a complex uh, trajectory and density. So, you know, at first it's at solid density. And as you heat it up, it expands and explodes. Mm -hmm. It, you know, really uh, becomes a strongly coupled plasma. Okay. Uh, and so there's some really, really interesting physics there. Uh, namely, uh, the material will actually undergo a metal to non-metal transition. So you- It just, you, uh, sorry, maybe I say something uh, a bit uh, stupid here, but just reminds me a, a little bit of some experiments they have at Sandia, right? With sort of inertial fusion, right? Yes, yes, yes. And so that's that's the Sandia Z machine. Yeah, exactly, and, exactly. Yeah, 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 Sandia Z machine. And so we work with uh, quite a few people at Sandia Z machine. It's the largest pulse power okay. facility. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we have some alumni from this research group that are working there, uh, but it's really- uh, hundred or so, maybe I would assume actually more scientists working on the Z machine alone. It's a all right, all right. Yeah, yeah. Actually, the the way I I got in contact with you is probably uh, through one of your side projects because I started using one of your codes. There is a multi bolt it is multi-term Boltzmann solver, in right, fact, right, right. for solving an electron Boltzmann equation. And uh, this was related to my some of the research I was doing during PhD. And I find very much related to that because also now that I'm doing postdoc, you know, although I'm studying some very application like on plasma processing, I would like still to keep some fundamental studies uh, ongoing right. uh, for, for my, the sake of it, you know, <laughs> for right. interest. <laughs> right, right. And so that, that's what I was doing. And I'll, I'll try to, you know, not take too much of a detour, but that's yeah, yeah. when I was doing the opening switch, it was uh, the, the opening switch was really interesting, but it was really looking at the fundamentals whenever the material expands and the expansion cools the material, you can really hit this sweet spot in the temperature density space where it undergoes what they would call a metal to non-metal transition. Okay, okay. And you know, that just, I remember as a grad student, that just sounded super cool to me. I mean, yeah. a metal to non-metal transition, what, what does that even mean? And you know, I really, I really poured myself into that topic and really enjoyed it. And I had a lot of fun. Uh, in terms of how I got into low temperature plasmas, it was one of those things that I periodically worked with on the side. Uh, I developed micro discharge, light sources, things like that. Um, worked on streamer discharges. Uh, one of my big topics prior to writing my Boltzmann code was uh, measuring photoionization capable emission okay. in uh, developing low temperature plasma. And that was... Uh, that was a project that was unofficial. It was not sanctioned, actually. Mm -hmm. um, it was, we had a, a vacuum, or I guess extreme ultraviolet uh, spectrograph here at Texas mm -hmm. Tech. And it was this uh, pristine piece of scientific equipment that was protected in the corner of the lab and no one was allowed to touch it. Okay. And, and uh, there was actually, the project was currently unfunded uh, fortunately, at the time, I was on a fellowship, so I wasn't yeah. really forced to work on any specific project. I could kind of do what I want, wanted. And so uh, my advisor gave me my main tasks, and you know, I was a diligent student, and I took care of my main <laughs> tasks. But uh, I was happy to stay after hours when nobody was around and start playing with the piece of pristine equipment. And I got in a lot of trouble whenever my advisor found out that I had fired up the machine and was actually doing terrible things to it. 
Uh, but that was one of my favorite projects, actually. I think that was actually for my PhD, that was my favorite project. And I think that was really the, mm -hmm. the main project that really solidified my interest in low temperature plasmas, really. Okay, okay. All right, yes. I would like to start one of the main topics, actually, of this, uh, of this talk. This is one of the reasons I wanted to have this chat with you. That is really about the data sharing. You know, when, when we are doing models, different type of models, we need the data to be used as input of the models, but also we need data to compare, to validate the model as output. And uh, I would like to start a conversation like kind of dividing into two parts. First of all, the first part is related to a project or platform that is called LSCAT, that you're also a member of LSCAT. Right. So if you can tell us a little bit more about that. And the second part, uh, there is a little bit uh, beyond, maybe if we can have some ideas, you know, beyond how can we expand it and so on. And here, you know, before starting, I have to mention, so, as I said, you're also a member of LSCAT. So when we talk about LSCAT, in some sense, you're talking on behalf of LSCAT. Nevertheless, uh, I, yeah. I, I don't want to put this, pre this pressure on yeah. you. I, so I would yeah. like to keep the conversation as more informal as possible. So these are sure, really sure, opinions sure. between two people doing research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, so uh, yeah, I want to be really careful with that. And <laughs> okay, okay. The, the, the LSCAT people, uh, I'm, I'm not really speaking on behalf of them at all. Uh, they're exactly. very careful. They're very careful to uh, to really make sure that we have a, a, a unified uh, approach to everything, and you know that one person doesn't really represent the whole yeah, project, yeah. which I think is a good. All thing. right. So if you can tell us a little bit uh, yeah. more, uh, what is LSCAT first of all? Yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah. yeah. So LSCAT really got its start whenever it really came. It was. Uh, I think the brainchild of uh, largely Sergei uh, Pancheshny, mm -hmm. who really realized that there was a need for kind of what you're talking about, data availability, data needs, um, with regards to electron scattering cross sections. And that's where the name LXCAT comes from, electron scattering LXCAT. Yeah. And so the idea was, or the, the observation that was made was that there were so many research groups that had you know, this research group had great cross sections for argon. This one had a similar set of cross sections from argon, and you know, they they both used a momentum transfer cross section that was measured by this guy in 1965. But this guy did a Born extrapolation on it. This guy he, he didn't do a Born extrapolation on it. And you know, they would do calculations, and they would find out that you know we're more or less using the same cross sections, and we're getting different results. Uh, there was issues that people would do really great work and develop new cross sections, better cross sections. And then that information really wasn't making it out into the community. Uh, you're familiar with this. It seems that some papers, for instance, you publish a paper, there's been a lot of really great papers. You can find them that have maybe at, at most five citations and you go yeah. read it and you go, how, how does this paper only have five citations? This is, you know, really, really phenomenal work. And there was a lot of issues with that, with cross sections. There were great cross sections out there that weren't that were underutilized. Uh, a lot of these people, and we were still running into this. A lot of people develop cross sections, and they don't really do any work to help the community have get access to these cross sections. And uh, then the work is more or less lost. In many ways, it is very lost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, so it really started out with the electron cross section, electron scattering cross sections, and I think there's you know ten lifetimes of work that could be done in terms of just properly organizing, coordinating, hosting, and managing electron uh, scattering. Yeah, cross -section. yeah, yeah, yeah. Then it expanded also, right? To, to right, right, and to so, other parameters it's, it's, or yeah. it's expanded into uh measured macroscopic transport coefficients mm -hmm. so-called swarm parameters it's expanded into uh ion potentials ion cross sections oscillator okay. strengths and all kinds of fundamental data that is necessary for low temperature plasma modeling yeah yeah okay so suppose there is someone who is a uh... I don't know, uh, calculating cross-section from a quantum mechanical point of view or uh, measuring it, uh, whatever. How can he or she can uh, contribute uh, to LSCAT? It's, it's incredibly easy. We try to make it as uh, 
seamless as possible. The idea is that LXCAT does not own any of the data. They merely host the data. So developers who produce this data through whatever process, um, they, they retain complete and total ownership of the data. That means they can put it on the LXCAT website if they don't like the way it's being used, if they feel like in some way it's, it's, it's actually uh, results in being a negative thing, they can always pull it back, but it's really easy. You go to uh, www.lxcat.net and there's a button for uh, contributors and then there's a link and you just, uh, it's, I think it's, don't quote me on this. I believe it's info at lxcat.net or something. In the okay, okay. But Maybe uh, I'll put the link, uh, yeah, the description of sure. the video, but okay. <laughs> yeah, and so anybody that has cross sections, uh, we can create a database for them. Uh, we can, they can, up, we can set it up so that they can upload and maintain their own data. Uh, some people don't even want to bother with that. They say, no, here's my cross sections. They'll send us a, an Excel table and you just, have yeah, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have to, what um, have what is really important for me because at the, at the end, you know, I'm interested uh, about uh, having, having a, a model of the plasma, for example, or a model of a, a swarm of electrons, for example, or ions, right. whatever. Um, is the who makes sure who is assures the quality of this cross section? You know, suppose I'm <laughs> from an unknown institute in the middle of nowhere, you know, and I send you some cross section. <laughs> Do you put it in your database or or not? You know, this is the question. Yes. yes. <laughs> The answer is yes, we, we do. Um, we maintain complete neutrality. Uh, that's, okay. that's something that we're very, very serious about. We, we can't give preference and say, well, these cross sections are better than these cross sections. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's not our job. That's, that's absolutely outside of our purview. We are strictly hosting the data. Actually, okay, this is uh, rather uh, interesting because I also have some some opinions about that. But uh, <laughs> this is my opinion. Eh? Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, you know. So uh, this is always stated, uh, in fact, also in the papers and so on, that LSK does not provide recommendations. And right. uh, I, I agree because it should also preserve, you know, diversity and so on. And, uh, um, and nevertheless, uh, I, I think it's also a sort of uh, scientific responsibility to say, okay, if you are using this cross section in your model, you're making some sort of assumptions, right? right. And this assumption may be better than others uh, uh, if you're describing a certain type of system. You, you know what I mean? In yeah. some sense, uh, I really yeah. care that we should push uh, to, to define the basics, you know, how we define uh, like this complete set that, uh, you know, <laughs> stuff like yeah, that. So, so this, um, this information has come up a lot, actually. Mm, yeah. uh, and so let's see where, where to begin with that. Uh, the one is the definition of a complete set. Okay, and yeah, we, yeah. we try to be very clear on that. Uh, that's a complete set being that this entire set of cross sections was provided by one contributor who developed them to be consistent with this set. You can't pull out an ionization cross section from this set. And yeah, that makes it yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, because it really was optimized such that all these cross sections together provide you the correct result. But this naturally progresses into what you would call in mathematics, a closure relation, right? And the idea is that you uh, adopt these certain assumptions that really make up this closure relation to, to yield your final result. Yeah, yeah. And in the context of that, I believe it would be useful to the community to really identify what the closure relations are. As a matter of yeah. fact, the complete set itself is a closure relation. The closure, closure relation there is that this set of cross sections, the assumption in which these were derived on is that this entire complete set of cross sections is used. But that naturally progresses into isotropic scattering was used. Mm -hmm. That's a closure relation. You, you this, this set of cross sections was developed and optimized as a complete set while assuming isotropic scattering, mm -hmm. while assuming uh, equal energy sharing between you know, your primary and secondary electrons in an ionization event. Uh, it was another cl closure re relation would be the, the method at which the cross sections were derived. If it was an electron beam measurement or if it was a uh, density functional theory, quantum mechanical calculation, uh, if it was derived by comparison of a kinetic model, a Monte Carlo code or a Boltzmann code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, 
And so all these things make up these closure relations. And we can actually see that in these cross sections that many of these cross sections, for instance, were derived using a two-term Boltzmann model. And they actually provide better results if you use a two-term Boltzmann model than if you use Monte Carlo or multi-term yeah, Boltzmann. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, exactly. And exactly, it makes perfect sense. But the then it, some people would, I think mistakenly or erroneously assume that, well, that just means that the Monte Carlo model or the multi-term Boltzmann model is inaccurate. And it's, well, no, you're, mm -hmm. you're misusing the data already because you're failing to enforce that closure relation. Okay. And so right now it's, it's a little more difficult to understand the origins of the data in Alexcat. There's, there's definitely a lot of things that go on behind the scenes uh, by the Alexcat team, a tremendous amount of work by these people. Um, I was really yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. when I when I first uh, joined the project, but there are efforts going on to really functionally communicate as best we can. What is the origin of this data? Where yeah, yeah. So, do you think uh, or do you imagine that uh, our, our community? Uh, I'm talking, you know, about scientific community in more general sense. Uh, um, will arrive to provide this sort of fundamentals. Uh, I'm thinking, for example, let's think about a specific problem that is a bit technical, but is is this problem of swarm analysis, right? Is this iterative optimization of cross sections mm -hmm. that is done by solution of Boltzmann equation like, and comparing uh, the results of this equation with uh, measurements of uh, swarm parameters? Um, now this. Uh, iterative optimization can be done in different ways. So it's an inverse problem in multiple solutions, right? right. So suppose uh, I'm changing the cross sections by end the magnitude or the threshold, or I let uh, a machine learning algorithm do that. And uh, we arrive uh, at uh, two different results that are totally possible by the definition of the problem. Which result uh, is uh, physically more accurate or which cross section I should uh, trust, let me allow this word trust more, you know, probably there's not a clear answer to this question, yeah. but uh, yeah. I would like as a scientist, if I have to use this cross section in the model to yeah. have someone who tells me a bit, a little bit the direction. Yeah. So I can, uh, I've lost a lot of sleep over that question. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Let's see. So that's something that has been brought up and been known for a very long time. It's in many of the early papers uh, doing uh, electron swarm analysis to refine cross sections going all the way to Phelps and, and not just Phelps, but really some of the, the classics in low temperature plasma. Uh, they've known for a long time that that's an issue. Uh, I am actually currently engaged in doing exactly that for a, a new gas. Uh, we're doing it for uh, Novec 4710. I'm not sure if you're familiar with okay. it. No, it's probably it's, one uh, of the attaching, uh, strongly attaching. And... Exactly. exactly. Okay, yeah, no. Exactly. It's, it's a uh, carbon fluoronitrile. It's okay. uh, very it's exotic, a, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a trademark product of the 3M company and it is intended to be an SF6 alternative. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. SF6 is a popular insulating gas in high voltage mm -hmm. applications, but it has a global warming potential about 40,000 times higher than CO2. Oh. So it's, it's a really, really detrimental gas to the environment. And so there's a lot of, <clears throat> we have a lot of interest in trying to phase out SF6 and, and do, uh, mm -hmm. do some kind of alternative. Uh, this Novec 4710 is a, uh, viable alternative but one of the big issues is mm -hmm. we have no cross sections for it there's, exactly. there's, no, so. there, there's no cross sections um and then the question we can do no plasma modeling we can do nothing mm -hmm. uh we're we're fortunate uh christian frank at eth zurich and no. uh a number of his students i i i can name a few of them but most of them are complicated last names that i would butcher <laughs> so i will i will uh, refrain from embarrassing myself more here uh, they've done swarm parameter measurements in, in these gases, which have been really helpful to the community. And uh, there's been a number of groups as well, actually. There was, another, there was another group out of China that just published earlier this year, an excellent set of swarm data. And we're, we're working on optimizing a set of cross sections from, for this gas so that we can do modeling. And the process is not very simple. Uh, we've also kind of in the 
in an attempt to improve our abilities, we've also been trying to refine cross sections for more simple gases, things like argon and yeah, yeah. nitrogen, just to really refine our algorithms a little bit because we, we have a good idea of where we should land. The question that you're talking about is, uh, you can have two different sets of cross sections that provide more or less the same macroscopic results. Which, ones do, you, which ones do you trust? And that really comes into, it's almost like a human machine interface, so to speak. You can't just feed your optimization algorithm, the swarm parameters and yeah. just say, go. Uh, you have to have, you have to interject some level of human intuition into it. And machine learning to some degree does that. I mean, that's, that's really the beauty of machine learning is exactly that. Uh, in our case, we're actually using a genetic algorithm. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very have, interesting. Okay. Yeah. And you have to, you have to really define the bounds of everything. You know, you can't mm -hmm. tell, you can't have a, a momentum transfer cross section, you know, that comes in at 10 to the minus eight square meters. You know, that would, just, exactly because at the end there is another constraint that there is uh, <laughs> this cross section should be physically meaningful right uh, you know so if the magnitude is completely off uh, uh, yeah. then or, or uh, th there are similarities of electron impact cross section between different gases and think about rotational processes in uh, right. nitric oxide uh, in co right. uh, right. h2o that you could probably retrieve cross section also by training uh, your neural network from other gases that yeah. i don't know yeah, but people, you people need have done this this has been this has been a really hot topic there's been a okay. number of groups uh, James Cook University, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, and it's I not just so. James Cook University, it's a couple of others. Oh, wow, my memory is really failing me right now. Uh, Stokes, uh, Ron White, and some others yeah. have been doing really, really nice neural net uh, optimization Okay. where they take huge sets of electron neutral cross-section for lots of gases, and they kind of build that machine intuition yeah, for... Yeah. How does this, you know, very fine parameter affect this swarm parameter? And they do that on, uh, you know, in scale issue where it's, you know, millions of factors that, you know, humans either consciously or subconsciously are actually processing and doing naturally. Yeah, yeah. And, and they do this and they're deriving cross sections and they're running into a lot of challenges. As you can imagine, it's not easy, but mm -hmm. uh, neural nets. Uh, they've they've got some really great models. There's another group out of India that's doing it. Okay, um, okay. So so there's some interest. Uh, I tried to I wrote a proposal to do it uh, mm -hmm. to the NSF, and uh, <laughs> I, I should have brought the reviews up here because they they were pretty they were pretty rough. Uh, okay. Yeah, but uh, it's it's but not easy. But uh, to to round this up, the uh, the idea whenever you're deriving these cross sections is that you have to use as much information as you have. It's not just a blank slate and swarm parameters. Yeah. There, we have an idea of what the attachment cross section is. People have measured, for instance, for this Novak gas, people have measured uh, the ionization cross section by ion beam bombardment. Uh, we know what the infrared bands look like. We know what the UV emission looks like. And so we can make estimations to what the energy levels are, where there might be in discrete energy levels. Uh, they okay. even, people have done density functional theory and have, mm -hmm. uh, have oscillator strengths and energy levels. And so we put confidence intervals on all of these things. We say, yeah. let's take the attachment cross section plus minus 50%. Let's take the ionization cross section plus minus 30%. Mm -hmm. And this is guided by the experimental errors that come from the papers, okay. the, the, the errors that come from the, that are quoted in the papers. And so talking about just in the general interest of, as you were talking about scientific data availability and things, it's been really important for us that the people who produce these data really specify confidence intervals and error yeah. and things like that and say this is the ionization cross section but you know our measurement error is 20 percent yeah, things yeah. like that are incredibly important okay okay and um, i would like uh, to come back a little bit more and if you can tell us a, a little bit um, what is the organ internal organization of the ls cat 
because uh, sometimes, and here I'm talking, you know, a little bit more uh, as a st student perspective. Yeah. It comes, you know, you, you, that you take this cross section, this cross section come a little bit from above, you know. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so, can you tell us uh, how you become a member? I think it's a voluntary uh, process, right? So you don't uh, get paid. No, 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 <laughs> but no. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> but unfortunately, yeah. um, uh, yeah, who, who manages this, uh, this project, basically? So there's a whole team of people um, at various universities. Uh, there's steering committees, tech teams, development teams. Uh, University of Eindhoven, of course, is a, a, or Eindhoven Technical University. University of Technology. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll get there eventually. Uh, yeah. uh, Laplace Institute in France are, are big contributors. Uh, that's, I mean, it's it's all on the Alexcat website. I'm sure I can bring this up real quick. Mm -hmm. uh, Sergey uh, is he's, he's at this point uh, ready to kind of move on from LXCAT from what I understand. I haven't interacted with him much. He seems to me like he always says he's going to uh, move on and then he stays involved. He, okay. he really works very hard and, and does a lot of work. Uh, let's see. Okay. And there are also different groups, right? Uh, if, I, if I am correct, uh, within uh, the LXCAT project, like some outreach, uh, there is a um, what is a bit more scientific part, uh, like uh, related on plasma and swarm. Yeah, there, and, there's uh, an outreach, which is just kind of the purpose of the outreach team is really to exactly what it sounds like. Outreach is to participate in conferences and you know interface with okay, people yeah. and let people know that we're hosting this data, um, encourage best practices with the data, things like that. Uh, as you can imagine. There's, there's a serious danger with hosting this data that mm -hmm. is that it is very quickly abused. Um, very, very, very often we, I, I get emails with my Boltzmann code, for instance, all the time from people that are telling me, well, I, I did this and then I did this. And so I did this other thing, which is just really atrocious. And then I got this crazy result. Do you know what happened? And so part of the outreach team is really trying to communicate to the greater public best practices okay. issues. Uh, you have the development team, which is really trying to uh, maintain the databases. Uh, people will uh, find errors, for instance, in the database and the, the tech team will go through and figure it out. Uh, mm -hmm. Bugs in the code, uh, somebody will click certain things and it'll cause the website to fail, stuff like that. Uh, okay, so can you imagine uh, maybe in the future also uh, a sort of structure that can attract, suppose there are people good in, in uh, communication, also students, for example, so LSCAT could attract the students or people good in, in research uh, um, and so on, or is it something very far? Uh, uh, do, you think, do you think LSCAT could attract uh, these sort of people as well? Uh, attract them for contributing to the project? For contributing, exactly, exactly. I, yeah. I think, okay, in terms of funding and so on, it's, it's really difficult because sometimes you're paid for doing a specific project, right? right so right, you right. don't want to be committed also to many other things that are extra. But uh... And so I think that's really kind of been one of the, one of the limiting factors. Uh, I think for all parties, I think almost everyone that's associated with Alexcat, this is really something that they do on the side. And, exactly. uh, you know, the majority of us, this is not the only thing we do on the side, you know. Uh, in terms of service to the community, I've got five or ten other major projects that I'm always involved with at any given time, and so uh, in terms of trying to recruit more people, that also would require more investment of yeah. time. And so it's 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 a difficult question. I'm not saying that it shouldn't be done, uh, but it's. It's finding, I think really the, the major limiting factor to LXCAT right now is that we really don't have, I think everyone is always looking for more time to contribute to the project. Mm -hmm. I myself, uh, I, I work on the project some, but I, I wish that I had more time to contribute to it. And okay, uh, okay. I'm, always, I'm, always, I'm always wishing that uh, I had more time to commit to this task that task, particularly yeah. with regard to LXCAT. And it's difficult. So when it comes to recruiting more people, 
I I barely am able to keep myself busy on the project. So yeah, true, true, um, true. And this is just me speaking for myself. I'm sure other people uh, at, at LX Cat would say, no, no, don't say that. We want more people. <laughs> um, and, and they're right. We do want more people. Uh, but it really is, uh, in terms of us reaching out, I, I get, I, yes, we, we could and probably should do more of that. But as it is right now, anybody that wishes to contribute, it's pretty easy mm -hmm. to get them involved. Okay, okay. All they have okay. to do is reach out and volunteer and say, hey. Uh, yeah, yeah. It would be, you know, I know this is a sort of dream and maybe not thinking about funding agencies and money or whatever. It would be very nice to have people like working full time on Zwarm, for example. Right that uh, now it's a bit lacking uh, or people connecting these two fields, those warm physics, plasma physics together. Uh, but okay, there, you know, we we'll see, we we'll, we'll open the, in the future. <laughs> there's There's been some efforts to that end by some of the LXCAT team to try to recruit full-time positions for yeah. PhD students to develop. Uh, really what you need is what we've kind of found out that as engineers and physicists we're really terrible at data management yeah, true. Uh, you know when it, that's uh whenever i look at a sql database i go oh oh no 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 bring me a electron momentum transfer cross section i, I don't want to do an S sql database and so the most effective people involved with this project on the technical side are people who really understand data management and data science and yeah. database uh, programming and management. It's not so much of an issue of the physics side of things. We really, I think, have a deficit of information largely on the database and development and management side of things. Okay. And really trying to even bridge that gap, trying to explain how do you, how do you explain to somebody who has degrees in computer science uh, the differences and nuances between rotational and vibrational cross sections and <laughs> rotational and quantum mechanical selection rules. And it, it you really need somebody who has expertise in both. And those, those people are really rare. Yeah. And this may bring me actually to the next question, like what can be improved in LSCAT? So from, you know, my understanding, uh, there are still a lot of already a lot of databases, a lot of cross-section availability, a lot of swarm parameters for electrons. Um, so do you think something can be improved in terms of data? So that yeah. some data are missing and also in terms of structure or platform. You already mentioned the database, for example. Uh, what uh, could be done in the future? So we already have a lot of contributors that are more or less uh, backdooring uh, functionality into the cross-section sets through various sneaky tricks uh, to, for instance, like super elastic collisions. I, I think you've, you've worked on this, right? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the super elastic collisions, for instance, the IST Lisbon database uh, has a couple of sneaky tricks to the LXCAT database can't really uh, manage which processes, officially speaking, was not designed to determine which processes or are reversible and uh, how these things would be used in, in a super elastic type collision. And so through the options of uploading the database where you can uh, input features that generally go unused in most uh, low temperature plasma codes, the IST Lisbon folks have been putting in little tags and keys that will that they can turn around and uh, flag in their own code and say, hey, this is a reversible process. It has this particular statistical weight, has these different things and so on, uh, so that they can incorporate super elastic collisions pretty seamlessly. And I think Bolsig is actually doing a very similar thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and whenever LXCAT was originally put together, uh, that that functionality was never never included. Uh, like I said, it's, it's really kind of a backdoor type trick that people have been using um but that's just one of a whole plethora of ideas that yeah yeah, yeah. what thing for example um it comes in my mind uh, for example is the availability of data for electroswarming mixture of gases mm -hmm. that uh, typically we optimize in a single gas but uh, if you have mixtures uh, maybe you discover that the cross-section you optimize are slightly different uh, if you put it in a mixture then you need to include resonances and so on and it's well, uh, something that uh, well, <laughs> yeah. a, a very common thing to do is to mix uh, 
And so this is something that we've been really interested in is going back to the NOVET gas. A very common thing to do, for instance, for uh, CO2 and a lot of gases is to mix it with uh, argon. Exactly, for example. And, yeah. you know, argon cross-sections are incredibly well-known. Uh, the excitation cross-sections are well-known. The momentum transfer cross-section has been measured 100 times at least. Uh, we have quantum mechanical calculations. So we know these things really well. Uh, you can do a 99% mixture of argon and something like a 1% mixture of CO2. And it's amazing how much information you learn about CO2 from that mixture, because you can really operate in a, you can really sample a region of the electron energy space uh, at different reduced electric fields in CO2 that you could never access yeah, with yeah. just a pure CO2 mixture. And so, yeah, that's, that's another point. Uh, of course, you can, we have swarm and transport data hosted for gas mixtures. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, there's a whole lot of work going into completely overhauling the, uh, the database completely. And uh, it's uh, yeah, yeah. There, there's, a, there's a lot of work there. There's, there's a lot of people that are proposing to develop, uh, that are writing proposals to get full-time support for a graduate student to work on this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've even uh, been looking at possibilities for trying to, it, it's, it's, it's touchy business because we don't want this to come across as a for-profit type thing at all. Again, mm -hmm. um, this is entirely volunteer and service for, for everyone that's been involved sure. with it thus far, but it would be really great if we could generate some kind of financial support so that we could create full-time positions for this mm -hmm. and trying to find that balance between maintaining it, it's a nonprofit as it stands right now and people can actually make financial yeah. contributions to the project ah, true, true. Uh, and so it's a nonprofit in which people can make financial contributions and i i agree i think it would be really great to have some dedicated full-time mm -hmm. at least one dedicated full-time employee i mean and yeah. In the most ideal case, this is something that could be managed by an entire team of people. But how you how you recruit the funding for that and maintain the project, that's that's it, it gets into incredibly it gets very complex very quick. Yeah, yeah. And maybe, okay, but uh, maybe some other ideas. So you think uh, there is also room for other databases, like sharing other types of data, you know? Thinking, for example, if you're modeling different type of discharges right. that you were mentioning before, just it's, uh... it's been dis it's been discussed. It's been okay. discussed. Uh, for instance, plasma chemistry is becoming very exactly. popular, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so there's there's a lot of discussion there as to what the the correct yeah. route is. You know, is is LXCAT the proper platform for that? Mm -hmm. uh, there's an argument to be made for yes, and and I've heard those arguments, and there's an argument to be made for no, uh, as well. I think uh, I think both have their merits. Uh, some people have suggested that it would be better for the LXCAT project to have a spinoff that would handle things oh, okay. like, like like plasma chemistry, and uh, the argument for for not adding more work to or not more work, but more purview to LXCAT is that, as I mentioned before, there's 10 lifetimes of work that can be done just in hosting these, yeah. these electron scattering cross sections and doing a proper, a proper job of that. Because one thing that's been really interesting is that the shortcomings, shortcomings that we never knew were going to exist. I say we, I, I haven't been involved with the project that long, mm -hmm. uh, but just uh, that I've kind of gleaned from the meetings, the shortcomings that have really been brought to attention were were things that people never really envisioned mm -hmm. uh, in the original formation of of the LXCAP project. Uh, we have very primitive, very humble beginnings in, in cross-section data management in the community. True, 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 true. The, for the longest time, the best cross-sections in the world were in filing cabinets and, you know, some random scientist's office yeah. and, you know, handwritten tabulated. And, and, and probably you would need a sort of uh, also to best practices or, you know, educational right. stuff for students. Because now if I look at the database, there are so many cross-sections that I can right. choose. Uh, there are also some these recommended soft list of software. 
And I think, you know, the new students should be able to distinguish between different software, which one I use, different data and so on. It is not an easy task. Right. Um, so. Yeah. And so that to it, we, we keep coming back to this and this is really I, I understand kind of the theme of what you're talking about in this in this whole uh, discussion, which is mm -hmm. best practices, data management, data sharing. Yeah, yeah. And I think, again, uh, LXCAT is trying to find the, the appropriate balance between hosting the data and not making recommendations and not playing favorites uh, yeah, yeah. because we we don't we don't want to do that we don't want to turn off contributors and have them say well you know this is a group of people from university a and you know they're always going to push they're they're always going to push you know data from university a and models from university a why would we even you know upload our data to their yeah, yeah. database that's that's not at all what we want to do so I think there's a balance to be struck there between encouraging best practices and uh, making recommendations for data sets. Uh, mm -hmm. There's, there's okay, really okay. A, a very clear line that, that we have to be very careful around. Yeah, yeah, okay. I would like, okay, to conclude this discussion. It was a bit technical, but uh, I enjoyed it uh, uh, really a lot. Uh, to, so, some of your opinions about uh, open sourcing of codes, because I've also developed codes and also best practices. You know, sometimes I feel, you know, because of the pressure of time, sometimes I write a code that is maybe not the best, you know, but it serves the purpose. Maybe yeah. I don't share it with the public because it does not have appropriate documentation, you know, and so on and so on. Yeah. But, uh, I, uh, you know, I think, uh, what do you think in general? What do you yeah, think? Yeah, is yeah, open sourcing I, important? I uh, really... I really struggled with that for a long time with my yeah, multi-term yeah. Boltzmann code uh, because I, I looked at this and I was looking at the LXCAT papers and they, a lot of people always talked about how we needed a multi-term Boltzmann code. And I was I was myself doing some Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo was taking too long. I'm also a terrible programmer, so that didn't help me at all. Uh, but my Monte Carlo uh, code was taking too long and the uh, two-term Boltzmann models were not accurate enough for what I was trying to do. And so I said, well, I'm, I wanna do a multi-term Boltzmann code. And I put in a lot of time into developing my code and I validated it uh, with uh, you know model gases, things like that to really make sure that at least to the best of my abilities, it was accurate, but the very first version of my code that was shared, uh, you've opened the code, you've seen it. It was, it was terrible. It was terrible. And so I think, uh, I think that we should have more open source codes, but I also think that like you're talking about here, I think that there's not, I don't think it's just pressure for the contributor of the code, but I think there should be pressure on the community to push back on that. Why, why are we so why are we so adamant that these codes have to be so clean, so pristine, so professionally developed? I mean, I would prefer that everybody had their codes completely out there and they all looked like garbage and, you know, they weren't cleanly packaged and refined and commented. Um, yeah, to yeah. Me, that it's, it's, also, it's also a matter of reproducibility, right? If you read a, right. a paper of mine, you should be able in a few minutes or whatever just to reproduce the data in a few minutes. Right. I mean, whatever time right, it takes, right. like easily, I mean, to, to reproduce the results that I got, right? I, I think so. And I think, yeah, it's a matter of uh, probably, it's also a bit matter of intellectual honesty in, in that sense. Right. Uh, that intellectual term. honesty is the yeah. big one. Intellectual honesty, I think, is the, is the absolute huge one there. Yeah, and probably, uh, yeah, that, that's true that, um, okay, maybe it's not required that we write, uh, you know, clean codes and so on, but I think we should also uh, probably, I don't know, pr promote, uh, you know, make sure that it's fine that you spend your time writing clean codes with best practices and everything, right? Sure. Uh, not only publishing a lot or producing a lot of results, but if right. you spend your time, write a clean code, you put it open source, this is also a very good contribution in the same way as you did a publication, you know, probably even and, more, I don't know. Yeah, I, th I think so. I've been, uh, my, my decision to put my multi-term Boltzmann code out in the public was, was I've been, in, I mean, elated, honestly. It's been, 
it's been really great uh, to see how much interest there really was in the community. And I had no idea. Okay. Uh, but it's, it's interesting to think that I almost didn't share it publicly. And uh, my reason for not doing that was exactly what you were talking about. Yeah, I, yeah. It, it wasn't well written. Uh, there were, there were issues. I mean, as with any code, I've never written a code before that I was a hundred percent happy with it. That's yeah, yeah of course. Uh, of course. <laughs> you, you, you put some cross sections into it and it starts throwing errors and saying, Hey, you've got near singularities on this matrix and this and that it's, or it's a near, near singular matrix in your group. And it, but it, exactly like you said, there's a matter of, uh, I think, intellectual integrity there that is this is a code that i developed uh it's what i use to make these calculations it's yeah. validated as cleanly as i can and i believe it's publishable i think it's technically sound strong work that's why i put it out into the community and i stand by it you you you, you own it you have to show some ownership for it and if you're if you're not willing to do that in some regard then i i think that's problematic i i I think it does yeah. less for the community. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, I agree. Uh, okay. Very interesting. Thanks, uh, Jacob. I think um, uh, that's it. We had a very nice conversation and um, I would say we keep in touch and uh, yeah. le let's see if, um, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Thanks for having me. I enjoyed the chat. Yeah. Bye.